Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Market Chat. My name is Richard Moglin, and joining me today on the show is Jonah Lupton, entrepreneur and growth stock investor. Jonah, thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I want to get started with some background questions. And I always like to start things off by asking you, um, how did you get started with investing? And what were some kind of key learning moments? So I actually, so I graduated college 2002. I started working for Morgan Stanley right away. So I jumped into the business at 22 years old. Uh, didn't, didn't really know much. I mean, obviously when you take classes in college, you learn a little bit about the markets. My father had actually been in the markets. You know, he'd been a financial advisor, a stockbroker for probably 25 or 30 years at that time. Um, so I learned something from him, but at the end of the day, you still learn most of what you know um, just in the business, right? So 2002, started working at Morgan Stanley, was there in their wealth management and private client group for a few years, moved over to Smith Barney, and then I went to a private trust company in Boston. So for, you know, from 2002 until about 2011, I was working in the industry, in wealth management, managing portfolios, you know, a variety of strategies from, you know, balance to value to growth, um, you know, dividend paying, you know, even managing some fixed income along the way. But, you know, as you grow your book of business, and I don't know how many people actually know this or not, you know, if you're in the wealth management business, you get paid uh, a fee based on your assets under management, your AUM. And if you really want to, you know, increase your income on an annual basis, you need to grow that AUM. You're going to get, hopefully, you're going to get some performance from the market, right? That takes your, you know, overall AUM from 100 million to 110 to 120, et cetera. But you need to keep adding accounts along the way. And the more time that you spend in the office managing portfolios, the less time you spend out of the office meeting with new clients, meeting with CPAs and attorneys. So, you know, you, you need to realize that you're better off handing that money off to a, you know, a, a PM or using separate account managers and then being more of like an asset gatherer and going mm -hmm. out there and spending more time looking for new assets to bring in. And I didn't like that. I didn't, I didn't like, uh, you know, going out there and having to beg for referrals and going to all these networking events and, you know, sitting on the boards of nonprofits, um, it just, it's time consuming. I just don't, I didn't enjoy the networking aspect of the business anymore. Um, I wanted to be, I wanted to be a portfolio manager. Like I only, I just wanted to sit in the office all day and do research and trade stocks and look at charts. That's what I actually enjoy more. So, you know, after nine or 10 years of doing it and kind of, you know, having that struggle between the, the retail side and then kind of wishing I'd been on the institutional side, I decided just to, to walk away from the business and get into some startups. So I actually launched my own tech incubator, brought in a development team. We were actually, um, you know, building our own startups and then working with other clients to help them build their startups. Did that for five years. And then I actually started a company called SoundGuard, where we created a soundproofing paint for hotels and apartments. That was going really well. You know, we, we were going to have a phenomenal year this year. Uh, and a lot of projects lined up for next year. And then obviously the pandemic hit, wiped out the hotel industry. The pipeline basically disappeared overnight, you know, lost two, $3 million of projects. And I'm still not sure what's going to happen with SoundGuard. Most likely I'll bring in a new CEO to run the company because I got to look forward. And in my future, I see myself getting back into the industry full time. And rather than just running my own portfolio, which is what I do now, you know, running, running money for clients or running some sort of a fund or an ETF. But I, I just love the business too much to walk away from it again. So the paint industry is probably in the past. <laughs> now it's now full-time financials, I guess, or full-time investments. Yeah. Very cool. And, and very disappointing about your business. Um, uh, does being a business owner, a small business owner, has that changed your kind of outlook and how you approach the market itself or, or not really? Um, I mean, I saw the question that when you sent it over to me and I was trying to think if my mentality has changed in any way, probably not. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think my, my investment style now um, is part just the types of companies and industries that I'm most interested in and ambitious about. But also, I mean, I, I did manage client money through the financial crisis 10, 11 years ago. And mm -hmm. I remember it fondly and I still have those scars. So I remember you know, what happens in a bear market and how bad it can be and how long it can last. Now, clearly we didn't see 
that sort of a bear market again this year because the Fed came in with their trillions of dollars and their bazookas and blasted it all over the credit markets and yeah. into, into our bank accounts to help stabilize everything. You know, I wish they had been that proactive 10 or 11 years ago, you know, maybe Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns would have, you know, would still be around, you know, maybe Merrill Lynch wouldn't have sold off in a fire sale to Bank of America and maybe all of our preferred stocks wouldn't have gone to zero, but <laughs> it was a wild time 10, 11 years ago and trying to manage client money and, mm -hmm. you know, there's only, I mean, clients are paying you to be invested more or less. And so you feel like, you know, and you never know where the bottom is going to be. So you can't, you know, just sit in cash and try to wait it out because I mean, that's just not the right way to manage money. So you just, you keep meeting with your clients and talking with your clients and telling them, be patient, you know, think about the long term. you know, we have a strategy, you know, you're, you're properly allocated, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, as they see their portfolio going down every month, you know, it starts to fall on deaf ears. So it, it just a combination of me kind of burning out back then and wishing I had gone the, the institutional route, you know, mm -hmm. hedge funds, you know, running money for a big foundation or endowment um, rather than running money for, for retail. But I still learned a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so why don't we get into your investing strategy? Because it's good that I'm having you on because... A lot of my previous guests have been more swing traders, position traders even. Um, so my first question, I guess, is how would you classify yourself? Are you more of on the investing side, a uh, trader? Um, how do you describe yourself? So I'm a little bit of both. I mean, and it's going to depend on, you know, what the market's given me to work with. Um, so I do consider myself more of an investor than a trader, but it's probably two thirds investor, one third trader. So I do post my portfolio on, you know, I, I meant I, have it on a Google spreadsheet, which is actually pinned to my Twitter account. So anybody can look and see what positions I, I own, at, you know, I update it at the end of every day. So I do have my core positions, you know, which are typically over 5%. They'll get as big as eight or 9%. And then, you know, a couple months ago, I think I took Tesla up to 15%, but that was, you know, and then as it rallied, like I hoped it would, you know, I trimmed it back down under 10 and I actually sold all my Tesla uh, this week. So you know, I don't, I try not to get married to any of my stocks. You know, if they do what I think they're going to do and they reach the point where I just feel like they're beyond frothy or the, you know, the upside over the next three to six months is just minimal compared to some of my other positions. Mm -hmm. I would, ra I would rather sell it, you know, pay the taxes on the gains and, you know, reposition that capital into some of my other holdings that maybe, you know, are about to rip or, you know, came back. Uh, you know, recently found a base on a, on a moving average, like a couple of my stocks did this past week. Um, so I have the core positions, you know, C limited, CrowdStrike, Square, et cetera. And then I'll trade around them. But I mean, you know, la this past year, I mean, Tesla was very good to me. Peloton was very good to me. Etsy was very good to me. They're no longer in my portfolio because they're up eight, nine, 10 X in the past year. And I just feel like the valuation has gotten to a point where it's just, I hate to use the word stretched, um, but yeah, I mean, based, you know, I have to look at the fundamentals for 2021 and then put what I think is a fair market valuation on that company. And if it's already close to that, then, you know, and some of my other positions I think could rally 30, 40, 50% in the next year, that's where I'm better off having my money. So, and if those stocks that I sold out, you know, happen to pull back 10, 15, 20%, I'll definitely consider getting back into them. Gotcha. And overall, what would you say your strengths and weaknesses as an investor are? So I think up until the last couple of months, my, one of my biggest, biggest weaknesses was charts, technicals, but I think I've gotten better at it. Um, thankfully, you know, there's uh, like Transpire, Transpire and MarketSmith make it really easy. Mm -hmm. um, I just think the software has gotten so much better in the last year or two that you know, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't try to integrate technicals into your strategy. So I do use, you know, the Bollinger Bands, the moving averages to try to help me determine when to start trimming a stock or when to start re-adding a stock or starting a new position in a stock. I mean, I know we're going to go into the charts in a little bit, but Futu is one that I'm, you know, I'm proud of right now because it, it bounced eight or 9% today. But I started buying that a few weeks ago, thinking it would bounce off the 20 day. And it blew right through it and then came all the way back down to the 50. So I kind of felt stupid for a couple of weeks as I was losing money on it. But seeing what it did today, hold the 50 and got a nice bounce. 
you know, I feel like uh, that's where the charts help me out. So, you know, rather than, you know, a week ago, just cutting my losses and running out of the stock, and then I would have missed today. So. Absolutely. And it seems like all the, all the stocks are, are definitely growth oriented. Are there specific themes within that, that you're focused on, whether it's uh, EV, semiconductor, uh, social media? Uh, yeah. What, what kind of themes are you focused on for this year and also going into the near future? So I think 2020, I was definitely more, you know, thematic focused because of the pandemic and trying to figure out what sectors or what niches of sectors would benefit most from the pandemic you know, people stuck at home, people working from home, et cetera. You know, a lot of these trends got pulled forward a few years. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, huge on e-commerce, huge on digital payments, huge on online gaming. Um, but, you know, those stocks have rallied 200, 300, 400 percent, in some cases, seven or 800 percent. I mean, you know, Fiverr is scaring me. You know, I still like Fiverr. I mean, the growth numbers for this year still look great at 40, 50 percent. But, you know, the stock's up, I think, eight or nine X in the last uh, 10 or 11 months. So, you know, just like you know, I, I remember the dot com bubble. I mean, not that these stocks are necessarily the same thing, but I mean, I've I've owned so many stocks over the years and I've watched them run up and then run back down. And I don't want to see that. You know, I don't want to play that game. So sometimes you just have to be a little bit more cautious and, you know, take your wins when you can get them and lock in your gains and, you know live to fight another day. So, so I think, you know, so going forward, um, I think I'm a little bit less, you know, thematic focused right now than I was in 2020. Um, even though I'm super bullish on EV, you know, I'm out of Tesla because mm -hmm. it just rallied so much. I mean, it got up to a hundred, a $650 billion market cap. So, you know, I, I loaded up. So I think it was, I forget exactly what date in, I think it was, either late November or early December when they announced or the S and P announced that they were going to add Tesla to the S and P 500. And I, I'd already done a ton of research and I tweeted about it, you know, what would happen to the stock once they get added um, you know, how much buying would have to happen by these indexes and then the front running by the hedge funds um, and, you know, the window dressing and, you know, the, the, what the fund manager are doing, you know, before year end, they want to show that they had Tesla in their portfolio. So, mm -hmm you know, when that announcement came out, I mean, I was super bullish on Tesla. I sold the bottom 20 or 25% of my portfolio that night and then loaded up on Tesla at around, I think, 440. Um, but, you know, as it rallied in the, the, you know, the following three or four weeks and it got up to 695 on the day of the S&P edition, you know, mm -hmm. that's where I sold a ton of my stock. And then over the next few days, um, I got out of the rest of it because I just don't see, I mean, I think some of the stocks in my portfolio can rally 30, 40, 50% over the next 12 months. I don't think Tesla can do that. So mm -hmm. I don't think, even though I'm super bullish on EV and I do own Neo still, mostly because of the, the technicals, you know, it pulled back and now mm -hmm. I feel more comfortable getting into it. Um, and I would love to get back into Tesla, but it would have to pull back 15, 20% for me to get back in. Um, and then same thing with e-commerce, right? I mean, I, I, I was super bullish on e-commerce in 2020 and it did what it was supposed to do. You know, all these stocks ran up 300, 400%. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm out of Amazon. I'm out of Shopify. I'm out of Farfetch. I'm out of Etsy. Phenomenal companies, but I just don't know how much left they can run, um, especially if we get a big rotation into value again, or we get a big pullback in the broad markets or tech, you know, multiples contract. I mean, there's a million reasons why these stocks back in, but I just, I see too many other opportunities in too many other industries for me to ignore and then just keep banking on the stocks that have been working. Absolutely. And you mentioned a term that I'm, I'm not sure everybody will, will know window dressing. Can you explain kind of what that is and, and if it actually happens since you, since obviously you manage money yourself. Yeah. I mean, I never ran a mutual fund. I mean, so I don't think I ever really did window dressing. Um, but when you get like the big funds, um, you know, that are all competing for large amounts of capital and, you know, they have to publish their, you know, their, their performance and their holdings at the end of each quarter. Um, you know, sometimes they want to show that they owned the, the winning stocks from that quarter. Mm -hmm. So even though that the, you know, the person looking at that fund may have no idea when they actually bought that particular stock, They'll see the stock in the portfolio and they'll just think that much more highly of the manager that they know what stocks to own. So it's, it's, 
it's kind of scummy, but I, it definitely happens. Um, I don't know if the hedge funds do it. I know the mutual funds do it. I just don't know what to what extent. So it, it's definitely out there, but I don't know if it's enough to really move stocks you know, in the last few days of the quarter or not. It's just a term that we always used to throw around when I was in the business. Gotcha. All right. So let's talk about stock selection now, because I'm curious as an investor, how you go ahead and do your due diligence. So uh, could you show us kind of, uh, or actually just outline the general process of how you uh, find out an idea, put in the research, put in that due diligence, and then finally end up executing and, and placing a buy order? Yep. So I mean, there's a few places I get my stock ideas. One is absolutely FinTwit, right? On Twitter, there's a lot of people that are always talking about stocks, and that is a good place to find some ideas if you're looking for them. The other place is probably screeners. So the one screener that I use the most often, it's not, I don't love it. It's good enough, at least for now, until someone creates a better one or I find a better one. I think, like you said earlier in our Pre-show warm-up, uh, Market Smith might have one that I like, so I'll definitely check that one out too. But I've been using Adam Finance recently, so I, I'm typically looking for stocks that are growing at least forty percent a year. Um, you know, market caps that that depends. But I mean, recently I've been looking for stocks with market caps under ten billion uh, mm -hmm. and, and at least thirty or forty percent growth. Usually, I start with forty percent growth and just see what stocks come through the screener. So I usually start something, you know, that broad, 40% growth this year. Well, at least, you know, 2020, right? I mean, if I'm, now that I'm doing the screeners, I don't, well, actually, no, I still do care. So if I was doing a screener tonight, you know, I would probably still use 2020, but I would also use 2021, 40% mm -hmm. growth both years, you know, market cap between, let's say 250 million and 10 billion, and then just see what comes through. And it, you know, might be 30 stocks, 40 stocks, 50 stocks. Most of them I'm pretty familiar with because I've already seen them in, you know, the stock screens every single week for the past six months. But every once in a while, there's a new name in there that I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. And then if, if I don't see any new names in there, sometimes I'll drop it down to 35% growth or 30% growth until I actually start to see some fresh names. And then I just have to go through and, you know, pick the ones that I think are the most interesting if it's biotech, I don't, I just ignore it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, pharmaceutical, therapeutics, genomics, all of those, I, I just don't understand. Even, you know, semiconductors and a lot of these other like really technical industries, I'll, I'll never understand them enough to feel comfortable buying a stock in that industry. So I just stay away from them. I don't know if I've ever, I think I've owned NVIDIA, um, but I've, I've never owned um, uh, a, semi a semiconductor other than that. So so I need to be able to understand the industry um, for me to buy a stock. But so the stock screens and then, so in terms of my, my so other place I get ideas. Um, so newsletters, I mean, I, I probably subscribe to 40, 50, 60 different newsletters. Mm -hmm. You know, some are from the big firms, um, you know, Morningstar, Barron's, those types of companies. And then others are just like the Substack letters that people on Twitter Um you know, put together and, and they'll write about different stocks. Um, so those are probably the three places. It's probably the, um, you know, newsletters or research articles, um, screeners, and then FinTwit. Like it's definitely not CNBC and Bloomberg, you know, very rarely are you going to get a stock idea off of, uh, you know, off of the TV. So if that's where you're looking for uh, your ideas, you're probably in the wrong place. And then in terms of like research, so you know, I don't, I don't look at the charts yet. I mean, I do go to the fundamentals right away. So that's when I'll typically pull up, you know, ticker. So mm -hmm. T I K R.com is typically where I go to, uh, I believe they get their data from capital IQ, which is also standard and pores. So, you know, it's, they're going to show you the consensus uh, estimates. So I think, so they just show you the, the consensus estimate, but then I also look at Yahoo finance because they'll show you the spread They'll show mm -hmm. you the consensus, but then they'll also show you the lowest estimate and the highest estimate. So you can kind of get a, a better feel for that spread between, you know, the analysts and, you know, the most bearish versus the most bullish. So those are the two that I typically look at for fundamentals. And then I'll start to dig into the company, assuming they've been public, public for a while. You know, you're going to have some analyst research reports that you can go through. You go to the website, you know, the company's website, investor relations link all the way at the bottom. And there you're going to get, you know, transcripts or, you know, recordings of conference calls. You're typically going to get some sort of an investor presentation. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can obviously look at the management team and the board and all of that. 
uh, get to, you know, get to understand the company, learn about the products. Um, and then from there, I'll, I'll dig into the, you know, dig into the fundamentals more, look at the numbers. Um, I, I do have a spreadsheet. Um, and I've talked about this before on Twitter, you know, I, my valuation model, which is a hundred variables right now. So mm-hmm. assuming that the company is large enough where the, um, ticker and Yahoo finance, well, mostly ticker is going to have all of those data points. Um, then I can, you know, add that stock to my model and just mm-hmm. see what, see what model comes out with for a 12 month price target. So that's kind of, I mean, that's just, that's part of my research process. I mean, when I do, and it depends, I mean, on some, com- some companies, if I just want to start a starter position, you know, if, if I look at the charts and the stocks already had a really big run, it's very unlikely that I'm going to start a big position in that company right away. Um, I might start a smaller position, which is maybe one or 2% and then see if it pulls back for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's, if it's already had a recent pullback and I get really bullish, then I'm likely to start with a bigger position, uh, maybe three or 4%, although 4% would be pretty large to start with. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, sometimes if it's a stock that, I'm, I'm interested in, but it's just really outside of my area of expertise or it's like really complicated, but I think what they're doing is really cool. I might just start, you know, what I call like a moonshot position, you know, which is typically like half a percent. And if it's a stock that I've started to do a little bit of research on, and it looks like it could move pretty fast before I get a chance to really dig into it, I'll just, I'll, once again, I'll start a, a, a smaller position just so that it's on my screen and I can watch it trade for a few days because there's just too many times where I'm like, Oh, that stock looks really, really cool. I'll put it on my watch list and you just kind of forget about it. It gets buried into all the other stocks in your watch list. And then you look at it three days later and it's up 15 or 20%. So, mm-hmm. you know, if, if it's one of those stocks that I just think it's cool and it might be a stock that I want to, you know, add to later, uh, better just to start with something small, get it on my screen. So at least, you know, sometimes it's only five, 10, 15 shares. I mean, just mm-hmm. to, just to have it on my screen so I can watch it trade throughout the day and then start to set up my limit orders as I do more due diligence on it. But I mean, for me to build a, a core position, I mean, I'm typically doing at least eight to 10 hours of due diligence and research. Mm-hmm. When I, when I do my Substack newsletters, you know, if I'm doing two per week, um, you know, each newsletter is for one stock. I mean, that's at least eight to 10 hours, sometimes more than that, when you start to uh, calculate all the time spent on writing and proofreading and whatnot. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, Um, you know, just reading an S1 a couple of times. I mean, that, that could be a couple hours by itself. Very cool. And would you mind bringing up just a ticker and just give us an example of, of kind of top criteria that you look for on that platform. So if you could just share your screen and do that first. And you can bring up, I guess, any stock, maybe one you're looking at right now. Yep. So, <laughs> so I was just looking at, you can see my screen, right? Yep. Yeah. So I was looking at Billy today because a bunch of people on Twitter were talking about it. And I guess it, let me see. Oh, so I think ticker. Um, so the price over here is actually the price from last night's close, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they only update their their price once a day, but I believe the stock was still up. 13 or 14% today. So it's kind of, I never heard of it before. So someone on Twitter explained, explained it to me. It's kind of like the YouTube plus Reddit plus Twitch of mm-hmm. China. Of China. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm not sure why the stock moved 13 or 14% today, but that's the one I was looking at last. Um, so let's just say, I mean, what's, I mean, we can use, we can use C since everyone probably knows this stock. So, mm-hmm. I mean, the numbers, the two numbers that I look at first, right? Well, the three, so mar- market cap and enterprise value. Um, and then on estimates, so I'm typically, I'm typically looking, look, the first two I look at are uh, revenue growth, let me just make sure it's in US dollars, yeah. Um, revenue growth and gross margins. Mm-hmm. So in, whoops, in my opinion, those are the two most important things to look at when you're investing in growth stocks. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of these companies, if they're growing 40, 50, 60, 100%, um, most of them, you know, when they're still in that hyper growth mode, they're, they're going to be losing money. So, I, I mean, I, I guess if they're still losing money, you at least want to see the number going in the right direction. You know, at least they're getting closer to profitability. Now, mm-hmm. obviously having better growth, you know, if the gross margins are improving, that's, you know, that's one way to get to profitability. Um 
you know, EBITDA margins, net income margins. You know, let's look at one. Uh, look at one that's closer to profitability. So, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about Futu. So, Futu is one of my biggest holdings. I've I've been in this stock now for I think three or four weeks. Um, it, I believe it IPO'd uh, this past summer, so I think it's been public for about six or seven months now. You know, rallied up into the low 50s, started to pull back. I added it in I think the mid 40s on the way down. Uh, hoping it would bounce off the the 20 day moving average and it didn't it fell mm-hmm. all the way you know broke through the 20 and then found some support in the last couple of days near the 50 but i mean the, the the fundamentals on this one are just phenomenal right i mean the growth this year uh, 171% next year i mean i've talked oh i could put this in us dollars um so ticker says 31% uh, on 486 million of revenue if you look at Yahoo Finance, mm-hmm. uh, their estimates are, I believe, over 500, and the high out there is, I believe, 600. So I'm not sure why the consensus estimates on ticker are so much more uh, conservative than the ones on Yahoo Finance. So mm. it's kind of hard to, you know, it's hard to know who to believe at that point. But I mean, clearly, you know, guys like me don't know these companies well enough, really, to, you know determine what that right number is, you know, is it 500? Is it 550? Is it 600? So, you know, in a case like this, where there's, you know, there's some discrepancy um, between ticker and Yahoo finance, I'll just, I'll use typically use a number in the middle somewhere. So, you know, 45, 50% growth this year for, for Futu, but then you look at the gross margins, 75%. I mean, they're, they're very profitable. Um, EBITDA margins, net income margins, incredibly strong, huge growth. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to love this stock. Fuji is kind of like the the Robin Hood or the the Weeble of of China, uh, based in Hong Kong. So, mm-hmm. I mean, not only is the story interesting, but I mean, the fundamentals back it up, and then now the technicals uh, support it as well. So, I mean, that's why I'm so bullish on this company for the next six to twelve months. Everything's kind of lining up properly right now. Absolutely, and Jenna, let me ask you this: uh, for each of these kind of main fundamental criteria, um, what is like? a base level that you look for? So is it like over 50% revenue growth, um, gross margins? What are you looking for? Uh, so, yeah, could you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, so I pulled up, um, yesterday I just created a spreadsheet for myself of all the stocks that I currently own and the estimates for this year, uh, for 2021, just to see how they all compared against each other. And cause I wanted to see if I owned any stock. So, Not that I sold Etsy for this reason. So the estimates for Etsy for 2021 were only like 12 or 13% revenue growth. Mm -hmm. And even though I think they're going to beat that handily, I'm not sure they're going to get up to 30 or 40%, which is where I really want to be. So, I mean, not that 30% is my absolute bottom minimum, but I don't think I own any stocks right now where revenue growth for 2021 is expected to be under 30%. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, if I'm just going through right now, um, so Celsius looking for 53% revenue growth in 2021, CrowdStrike 50%, DraftKings 54%, DocuSign. So DocuSign is probably the lowest one that's left at about 38%, although mm-hmm. I think that might even be a little bit conservative. So, I mean, I think some people call DocuSign a, you know, a pandemic winner, a COVID winner. I think out of a lot of the stocks that did benefit you know, let's say Pelotons and maybe Etsy's and Zoom's. I think Zoom's going to be pretty sticky revenue. Well, I shouldn't say that. I think some of Zoom's revenues will be sticky. I think all of DocuSign's revenues will be sticky because mm-hmm. anyone that started to use DocuSign during the pandemic, I don't think they're about to go back to the old way of, you know, mailing out documents to people, having them mm-hmm. sign it and mailing it back. Like that's that, that is so archaic now since DocuSign's available. So any revenues that DocuSign's pulled forward, I don't see them losing any of those revenues. Whereas, Mm -hmm. you know, I think once the gyms open, I think people will start to, you know, be less excited about jumping on their Peloton every day, right? They'd rather Mm -hmm. go to the the gym and actually see people and socialize. At least that's me personally. And even e-commerce. I mean, I, not that I expect the malls and retail stores to flourish, but I do think that some people will go back to, you know, shopping in brick and mortar stores, because it is actually nice to be able to try on clothes <laughs> before you buy them. So, 
even though I still like e-commerce long-term, I'm just not as bullish going forward as I think other people are. And I think the valuations have gotten stretched. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Fastly, the estimates for this year are a little bit more conservative than my own estimate. So I think the analysts are looking for maybe 35% revenue growth. I'm closer to like 40 or 45%. Um, I'm, you know, I still got my fingers crossed that TikTok maybe comes back. Um, Futu, 50%, Fiverr, 46, Grow Generation, 62. Uh, so one of my positions that I'm super excited about that I don't think most people have ever heard of is Make Your Trip or Make make My Trip. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, a, it's like the Expedia of India. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they got hammered this year, obviously, with the pandemic and no one able to travel over there. But um, you know, growth is going to explode this year. They have huge growth, gross margins, about 80%. Um, so I think that's, that's one for people to keep an eye on. It's only a two and a half billion dollar company and they'll do probably 500 million in revenue this year. So, you know, what's that five, f- maybe six times sales. Cause it was up 5% today. So let's say mm-hmm. six times sales with, I mean, this year it's like 180% revenue growth and 80% margins. I mean, that's, that's an interesting business for people to keep an eye on. Mohawk, which is a company that was in my newsletter last week, they should grow mm-hmm. at least at least 60, 65% this year. Um, Cloudflare, Cloudflare, Pinterest. So so all those, I mean, all my companies that are in my portfolio right now should grow or expected to grow at least 40% this year. Um, you know, the average, if I averaged it out, it's good. actually, that's, I can do that right on the fly. What's the symbol for Make My Trip, by the way? Uh, MMYT. And MYK gotcha. Yep. And MYK is, is the other one, right? Uh, MWK is mobile. MWK, right. Yep. So if I, now I think, so Fetch, uh, Farfetch and Etsy are still in here. Etsy is going to drag this number down a little bit, but um, oh well. So the average revenue growth for my, the stocks in my portfolio based on the consensus estimates for 2021 is 56.8%. Not bad. If they can hit it, <laughs> but I mean, obviously, if they don't hit it, you know, the stocks get cremated because they're already Absolutely. selling at lofty multiples. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's and that's good. That's the risk that we're taking this year in 2021 is if you get any multiple contraction, and and, and this is, you know, a lot of the current valuations, the prices some of these stocks are at right now. You know, this growth is already priced in. Um, you know, fastly. Like I've loved Fastly this year. I mean, they've I've made a lot of money, and then I also got burned a couple of times. But I mean, overall, I'm still positive on the position. But I mean, I don't know. I don't know. At a ten and a half billion dollar market cap, you know, and maybe four hundred million dollars in revenue this year. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it's that's expensive. I mean, if they don't do at least forty percent growth this year, that stock is overpriced. So, mm-hmm. you know, the expectations on some of these companies are are really high, and I'm just not sure uh, if all these companies are going to be able to hit those numbers. Although I will say, in Fastly, um, you know, yes, they benefited from the pandemic because a lot of their biggest customers are Shopify, Pinterest, Etsy. So as people were spending more time online, they were obviously using Fastly right behind the scenes. But a lot of Fastly's other biggest customers are the travel companies. So mm-hmm. Airbnb, um, JetBlue, I'm trying to think who else is in there. Uh, Hotel Tonight, which is not owned by Airbnb, I believe. So as the travel industry comes back, um, or as the economy bounces back, I, I think Fast, Fastly will win that way as well. So um, I don't think you know Fastly isn't just a, a COVID winner. Absolutely. Um, would you mind bringing up just TrendSpider real quick? Because I want to yeah. ask you about how you decide to actually enter a position, whether you're using moving averages, and also it'd be great to talk about how you decide to trim positions right here as well. Yeah. So as you can see, I mean, so Celsius is actually up on my screen right now. So I was looking at that one earlier today. So I actually did trim some Celsius today. And the reason is because it started to poke through this Bollinger Band. So you can see, so the three Bollinger Bands that I have, so I, I use, so the, off of the 20 day moving average, and then it's two standard deviations, two and a half and three, you know, mm-hmm. both plus and minus off of the 20 day moving average. So typically not all the time. I mean, it's not like a, a strict policy, but more often than not, once the stock starts to poke through the Bollinger Band, I'm going to at least consider trimming it. You know, maybe it's a three or 4% trim, maybe it's five to 10 
And then as it, you know, climbs and hits, you know, keeps poking through more and more levels of the Bollinger Bands, you know, it's probably going to keep on getting trimmed because, you know, you can see right here where, you know, it, it got up, you know, so typically when you see it start to get through that second and third Bollinger Band, you know, a day, two, three days later, you get that pullback, you know, right over here, big pullback. So I, I feel like the Bollinger Bands, at least for me personally, are a good indicator of when, start, when it's time to start trimming a position. Mm -hmm. For me, I actually noticed that, uh, yes, they can get extended above that Bollinger Band, but I actually like buying and, and owning stocks that kind of are always near the top of that because that shows they're under accumulation. There's a lot of power behind that move. I mean, even that gap up, that was just kind of the start of this strong move from 35 to 45. So right, right. I, I, li I like seeing the stocks up there, but obviously... Uh, you're right. They can get overextended and go too fast, too quickly. So I didn't, I didn't trim any Celsius here. Um, so sometimes I do wait until it gets to the two and a half. Mm -hmm. And so uh, today was actually I'm trying to think that I trim. I might've trimmed a little bit of Celsius last week, um, but I didn't, I wasn't trimming it right in here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, another stock I trimmed today was Fiverr mm -hmm. and I trimmed it before so to be honest, I, it's not even anywhere near the Bollinger Bands, but, you know, after looking at my spreadsheet and just where this stock has come, you know, come from over the last year and just wondering what might be left or not left in the tank for this one, I just felt like, you know, I don't see 30, 40% this year, at least from these levels. So, and some of my other stocks, I believe can do that. So, mm -hmm. you know, this was a, uh, what was, let's see. Fiverr is so after the trim today, Fiverr is a uh, about a 3.8% uh, position. So, you know, it's, it's, I, I guess I wouldn't call that core anymore. Um, but I mean, it's not like I, I didn't dump it out of my portfolio because I still like it, but mm -hmm. I just, I just think, you know, I think I trimmed it around 205 or 206. I, I just, it's one of these stocks that if it pulled back 10% at the beginning of the year, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so I'm just, trying to play a little risk management here. Absolutely. And uh, let me ask you this. So I've, I've often noticed that you like to trim stocks pre-market, maybe when we have a gap up. Um, could you explain kind of your methodology, how you decide which stocks to trim? Are you doing them all at once? And uh, yeah, how you decide to trim and also add back on maybe once they drop uh, closer to that 20 day moving average. Right, so I mean, some stocks, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think it was Monday, uh, where Monday, I think I was up two or 3% pre-market and thought it was going to be a pretty good day. And then the market opened and boom, it was just like we fell off a cliff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously I didn't see that coming, but I did do a little bit of trimming pre-market. Um, so sometimes it's just kind of, you know, my instinct or a gut feeling. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's better to be lucky than smart. So, and I think more often than not, it's just kind of luck where, you know, you just feel like some of your positions are maybe a, a little bit too frothy, especially after last week. I mean, I think coming into this week, I think I was up 45 or 50 percent on the month. Um, and then I got hammered on Monday and Tuesday. <laughs> so yeah. now yep. now now I'm up like 30 or 35 percent for the month, you know, which is still good. But, you know, you look back and you're like, you know, last week is just everyone was so enthusiastic. You know, everyone on, on Twitter was like, this is so easy. All my stocks are up 5% every day. I'm at all, you know, I should have, I should have been more aggressive in my trimming just based on that, you know, that enthusiasm, that, you know, euphoria, but you know, you, you can't always just base it on what people on, on Twitter are saying, you know, that's a hard way to run money. So, so, I mean, I like today, I mean, I didn't do any trimming today pre-market because, you know, I was, I got hammered the last couple of days. So it's not like I felt like any of my positions were, you know, getting ahead of itself. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, as we, you know, I, I was up four and a half percent today. So that's when I started to do a little bit of trimming just towards the end of the day. You know, like I said, uh, trimmed a little bit of fiber, trimmed a little bit of uh, Celsius, trimmed a little bit of my grow generation, trimmed a little bit of my Neo. Um, that was pretty how much, much it. Jenna, how much are you trimming when you're doing do you decide to take some off? Um, so my, let's see. I mean, today it was, it was pretty minor trimming. So I trimmed grow a couple times altogether, maybe 4% of my position on grow. Um, Fiverr probably, let's see, just, rather than try to do math. Um, 
fiber was a little bit more aggressive. So it was about 12% of my fiber I trimmed today at like 205. Where did I trim it? And do you have a plan going into the week? Like if the stock gets up to this level, I'll take some off. Or are you just kind of doing it day by day uh, so and seeing where it goes from there? Yeah, it's more day to day. I mean, it's funny how many times, you know, I should probably probably stop doing this. But, you know, you wake up in the morning, you see the market, you're up, th- you know, two, three percent pre-market. You're like, OK, I'm going to do a little bit of trimming today. And you start to set set your sell orders for the day. Like, OK, I'm going to trim DocuSign at 250. I'm going to trim, you know, Roku at 360. And then the market starts to rally. And you're like, oh, shit, I don't want to trim too early. Right. So you you cancel your sell orders. <laughs> then All of a sudden, the stock drops. You're like, oh, my God, why didn't I trim it? I'm an idiot. So I feel like more often than not, I'll set those those sell orders um, and 80, 90 percent of the time. Uh, if I canceled them, I regret it pretty quickly. So. I think in 2020, because uh, 2021, I think it's going to be a choppier year. Um, I think the active managers will uh, will be able to add a lot of alpha compared to the, the buy and sell guys, you know, assuming that they're good at what they do. Um, I think we're going to get a lot of these, you know, rips and dips as we get, you know, economic data and, you know, COVID data and vaccine data, you know, all the stuff that's going to come in the next six months, you know, tax rates, blah, blah, blah. I think there's good, you know, so I think I'm going to be a little bit quicker with the trigger in 2021 and, you know, look to trim when things, you know, so maybe instead of waiting until something gets up to the, the two and a half, you know, Bollinger band, I trim it when it gets to the two uh, and, and really, you know, take your gains when you can before they're gone. Gotcha. And would you mind uh, talking through a chart of maybe a stock that you just bought and uh, explaining what you look for in terms of an entry setup? And also how you kind of add more as it drops, maybe, uh, I think you mentioned you use limit orders. So if you could explain that process, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I think we, I mean, we, I know we talked about food too. So I've been in food too since right about, let's see, I think it was right like the mid forties. I started buying it, you know, wrote it down to the 20, you know, got a little bounce. I got all excited thinking that I had timed it perfectly. And then we broke through and, you know, got a couple of these fake breakouts and then boom, came back down to the 50. So, you know, we got right when we got around here, you know, 40, I started really adding to my position over the last, you know, last week I was buying a lot of Futu. Um, I was trimming some of my other positions just to add to this one. And coming into yesterday, Futu was actually my, the biggest position in my portfolio. Um, and then yesterday on the big pullback in Square, C, Crowd, um, I added to those positions. So now they're back to one, two, three again. Um, but then we got the nice bounce off the 50 I'm trying to think. So what's another one I added recently? Um, I mean, I added, I added a couple small ones today. I'm almost scared to talk about them because I haven't done a lot of due diligence on them yet. Um, what about UPSD? I think I saw that that was in your portfolio, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that was my deep dive in my newsletter that I did a couple days ago. So mm-hmm. I think when I, when I added it, I, I think it ran up 10% as soon as my newsletter went out. So I was hoping that that was the beginning of a nice little rally. Um, so this one's going to be hard. I mean, this one's such a, a recent IPO. It's going to be hard to really um, get anything from a chart. But I mean, so this one, I did not buy this one based on any technicals, really. I bought this one exclusively based on the fundamentals, the story, um, I, I just how important I think AI is going to be going forward in certain industries. So Upstart operates in the credit and lending industry. Um, the team that started the company eight years ago actually came out of Google. They have you know world class VC investors behind the company. They came public uh, three weeks ago. You know I think it was the same week that. Airbnb and DoorDash came public. So everyone was paying attention to those two and Upstart kind of, you know, uh, was kind of came flying, you know, under the radar. So I really hadn't seen anyone talking about this name at all. And then someone just happened to DM me and ask if I knew anything about it. So I looked into it. I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. So, you know, typically the underwriting departments, you know, whether it's a personal loan or a mortgage, you know, they're using FICO scores, which has been around for 30 plus years. And it's just a very limited set of data that makes up your FICO score. 
versus you know, what an AI powered model can do, looking at hundreds of data points over many, many years. Um, that takes into like, you know, your geography, your cost of living, like all, you know, down to like where you went to school, all kinds of stuff. So, and I just think that's the future of the credit and lending industry, you know, where you can have a more efficient, faster, cheaper model, you know, determining who gets approved for these loans rather than having, you know, three bozos sit around a table for eight hours, you know, Nope. Yes. Nope. Yes. I mean, like I've seen underwriting departments when I used to work at a trust company, uh, you know, we had a, uh, we were partly owned by a bank. So I became good friends with the guys in the commercial real estate department. And they literally met twice a week to decide whether or not they were going to approve these commercial real estate loans. Like that's insane versus, yeah. Upstar, you know, Upstart is powering um, so they, they built like a consumer facing cloud application that banks can kind of, you know, plug into white label. So, you know, the, the customer of the bank goes to the website, approve, you know, applies for a loan. They don't know that Upstart is, you know, behind the scenes powering the whole thing because it's all branded with the bank's name. But mm -hmm. within seconds, you know, within seconds, this AI model is running those 1600 variables and approving you or not approving you. And I believe if, if um, I'm just trying to remember that, you know, a couple of days ago, but I believe it was 70% of people that apply for a loan don't even have to provide, you know, any additional documentation. They don't have to get a, on, a, on a phone call with anybody. They're approved within minutes and all the back testing data that, they, that they've done, as well as partnerships with the, like the, I don't know, the federal credit, I forget the administ, you know, the, the, NAF, the, the government mm -hmm. agency that they work with, but, uh, they've proven that they can they can um, they can approve 173 percent more loans while decreasing the number of defaults. And that's big. It's huge, right? I mean, because that's just added revenue to the bank. Um, and then over the last eight or nine months since the pandemic started, the loans approved using Upstart have a five percent missed payment versus the national average at eleven percent. So even in like the worst of times, you know, they're able to, you know, determine which people are really higher risk. And one of the founders explained it really well in an interview. He said, um, I almost want to bring it up so I don't misquote it, but what did he say? He said, if you, oh crap, hold on, let me just bring it up because it was, it was really good. And like, as soon as I heard this, I'm like, oh God, these guys get it. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Let me just pull up, upstart. So, Give me two seconds. Yeah, um, no problem. I just want to find the quote. So it's three founders. Uh, two came from Google and then one was a, a Thiel fellow. So Pierre Thiel started like this fellowship and was basically like paying really smart kids to skip college and come work for it, you know, try to start a company and he would back them. Um, so the third founder was like 20 years old when he started Upstart with these other two guys. Wow. Um, what did he say? Hold on. I can't believe I wrote all of this. Wow. It's extensive. Yes, it was. I don't think people realize how, how long it actually takes. I'm sure they appreciate it. <laughs> I was actually hoping Upstart would reach out to me and be like, hey, great write-up. You nailed it. <laughs> but no one uh, – I actually did reach out to the IR, the IR department, and they're like, hey, we're in our quiet period. We can't even say anything to you. So mm -hmm. uh, I, free, I I can't find it. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, like, talk yeah. to you and scroll through it. But he bas basically said that – um, you know, if you, if you take out a loan and you don't miss any payments and you pay off the loan, then your interest rate was too high. Right. Mm. And if you do miss a payment or you don't finish paying off your loan, then your interest rate was either too low or you should not have been approved by the, you know, for a loan in the first place. So mm -hmm. I know it's not quite that simple, but like when you think about it in those terms, you realize how many people, um, do pay, you know, too much in interest rates. So I believe, I think it was 28%. So I believe that the people that get approved by them pay 28% less uh, on an interest rate than, uh, than other, um, you know, models, underwriting models that are out there. So not that I didn't, I didn't know we were going to talk about uh, Upstart that much, but yeah, I mean, this is, so this is the company that I'm really bullish on just based on what they're doing, the size of their industry, because they're not, now they're, uh, they started with consumer loans. That's what they've been doing for the last seven years. And now they're getting into auto loans. And then hopefully this year or next year, they'll get into mortgages and then credit cards, and business loans. So, you know, because I, I just think the whole credit lending industry is is ready for a massive disruption. 
and it's it's possible these guys could be the ones to do it just like lemonade is trying to do it for the insurance industry mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i'm also in so it's funny after i did all of this research and really got to understand the power of ai i got super excited about lemonade so i jumped back into lemonade and it just so happened to be the day that the stock was down you know 10-11% uh, because of the 6 month lockups and mm-hmm. now it's now it's rallied i think 15% in the last 2 days so that was just that was more luck than anything else absolutely and if you go back to the chart uh, on the technical side, um, this came up on my screens. I like to look at the IPOs because there's a lot of great growth here. And the numbers for this was, were fantastic. But I love how it rallied right from the start all the way up to 45. And now it's slowly tightening up a little bit on, on the right-hand side. And it still hasn't quite formed the IPO base, which is right. what we call the first primary base. But it looks promising. And if it does take out that kind of low at around 38.50 or so, it might need a little bit more time to shape up, but overall, I mean, this, this kind of has all the characteristics that I kind of look for. I'm not quite sure what the dollar volume on this just yet is, but uh, it looks good from both a fundamental and also the technical side of things. I know I'm mad at myself for not catching this one sooner. I think the IPO priced at 20 and I think it opened up around 26 and then ran up to 29. That's a great Uh, sign. Yeah. Yeah. And then now it's obvious, you know, I mean, that, that was a great first day pop, but then you look at like what Airbnb and DoorDash did, you know, up 70, 80, yep. 90, hundred percent. And it's like, oh my God, some of the IPO numbers had, over the last couple of months have just been insane, which I think is why we're going to see more of these direct listings. And now that you can raise primary capital with the direct listing, you know, that's going to be a good alternative for the, for companies to go public and, um, you know, not leave too much money on the table. So now, would you ju- do you jump into companies before they get through the six month lockups? Yes, I will. Um, but I will never trade them the first few days. I have to wait for that first primary base to form. Um, just so many of these IPOs, and I, I'm actually interviewing Kathy Donnelly from the Lifecycle Trade. I don't know okay. if you're familiar with that book, uh, but they studied all these massive uh, super stock IPOs and analyzed the perfect time to buy them. Um, and you either want to wait for the IPO base or when it does that first longer term primary base, kind of what we saw CrowdStrike do this year and buy it once it takes out that, that first high that it breaks, if that, gotcha. if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, cause I, I remember Snowflake. I mean, I thought I would buy Snowflake if it came public at around 50 or 60 billion, but I think mm-hmm. by the time it opened, it was 85 or 90 and, you know, around 240, 250, I think is where it opened ran up to 300 for a couple minutes. And then over the next week or two, it came all the way back down to about 215, 220. You know, that's where it formed a base, I guess. That's where I should have gotten in. Uh, and then from there, it rallied up. I mean, I forget. Let me I'll Yeah, bring up. it up. Yeah. Whoa. Let me see if I can shrink this down. There you go. Yeah, there you go. How far back does it go? Was that, some, wait, was that September? Holy cow. Was it that long ago that Snowflake came public? Jeez, it feels like it yeah, was maybe. More, wow, it feels like it was more recent than that. But I guess that's only yeah, three four months away. So, I mean, where did it? So it got up to yeah. So like the first day, that was just insane. Got up to like three what three eighteen three nineteen, and then pulled mm-hmm. all the way pulled all the way back down to what two ten to eleven somewhere down here. That's where I I guess that's where I should have jumped in. I mean, would you have known to jump in here? That's definitely a more risky entry. I probably would wait on this stock until it takes out that first high that it sell on that first day. Um, and or or just before it on right near the 23rd of November would probably be where I, I'd be looking. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So once it once it breaks above that previous high, you that's when you look to get in and then Yeah, that's what we would call the pivot price right there. Okay. Um, if it breaks through that on volume, that's that's a good buy signal for these IPOs. So do you, do you use? I, I think I've seen you post about it. You use uh, VWAP, right? Uh, I don't. I, I'm trying to learn that. Uh, ben Pattern Profits. He's he's been posting all these charts, getting me excited about it. Brian Shannon's been encouraging it. So I probably will add that to my arsenal, but uh, not not yet. But I know okay. the the anchored VWAP from the IPO price is definitely something that those guys use. Right. Okay. And that pro- that probably would have helped someone on this one too. Um, I've never really used it. Um, I mean, see, and, and that's where, you know, I, I don't, I don't invest on technicals alone. I have to believe in the story, the fundamentals 
And I mean, when Snowflake came public, yeah, I think they were still growing at 130, 140%, but that was obviously going to slow down this year to I think 100%. And, you know, looking, looking, you know, back when they came public, you know, even in October, November, as I just kept looking at it, as it pulled back, um, you know, even looking at 2021 numbers, you know, what the price to sales multiple was going to be, it just didn't make any sense to me. And that's why I'm still, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to jump back into zoom yet, but I mean, I've been, I've been out of zoom for the last three or four months. Cause I just, I figured at some point we have to look at 2021 numbers. We can't worry about how well they did this year. Mm-hmm. And you know, what are they going to do next year? Uh, I mean, I think the revenue estimates right now are somewhere around 3.6 billion. I mean, even if they blow that away and do 4 billion, you know, I think the, the market cap is still somewhere around 110, 120, actually maybe it might be down at hundred now. Yeah. Why don't you bring up the chart of zoom? If you got a second. Yep. Because uh, for me, it looks like it's forming the left side of the base, maybe starting to bottom a little bit. But I, th- for me, for my approach, it needs time uh, to really make sure digest everybody who's selling uh, at this point. Right. So, I mean, I got into Zoom somewhere, I don't know, somewhere back here. No, actually, it was, no, it was earlier than that. Yeah, I traded it around there too. As I retook the 50 day, that's that's kind of my most recent big buys when I when I got into it. So I first got into Zoom around, I think 110 mm-hmm. um, and then wrote it up to, I think, 220 and felt like a genius because I made, you know, I was up a, a, up 100% and mm-hmm. then, of course, sold it way too early as it rallied all the way up. And I think I jumped back in somewhere around 350, wrote it up to 450, got out. So I've traded this one a few times as well. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I just, I worry about the current, you know, even even though it's pulled back, I think 35 or 40% from its highs. Um, I just, I still worry about what, what kind of digestion in terms of, you know, the market cap or at least the fundamentals catching up to the market cap, you know, does this thing go sideways for three to six months? Um, you know, is there more downside? I mean, obviously it's, it's below all the moving averages, right? Yeah. Yep. And, and you see those big gap downs right. for me, that's, that's a sign that institutions are, uh, getting rid of some shares at least. I mean, I, I think it needs time to, to really form out a nice longer term base, uh, but it's definitely one to keep an eye on because they're right. disruptive technology, great growth numbers. And if they introduce some more products, I mean, that could fuel so much future growth. I mean, everybody has a Zoom account right now. I mean, we're, we're recording this podcast <laughs> on Zoom right now. So um, it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely going to keep an eye on this. And right. if it starts recovering all those key moving averages, um, I'll look for a nice low risk entry where I can uh, get out quickly if if it turns against me. So if I throw in the hundred day moving average, okay, it's below that. Yeah. Um, I don't even. I don't think I even have the two hundred as an as <laughs> as an option because I only. I don't think any stocks that I'm looking at right now uh, are even close to their two hundred day moving average. So, um, yeah. I mean, with Zoom, so you know, if they do four billion this year, you know, in twenty twenty one, hundred billion dollar market cap right now. So it's trading at what 25 times sales. So normally like the very first test that I use just for the fundamentals for growth companies is I want to see the current price to sales multiple at 50% or lower than the growth rate. So if the, if the current uh, price to sales multiple is 25, then I want Zoom to show me 50% growth. I want to I want to be able to look at the estimates, the consensus estimates, and see 50% growth or more next year. Now, it, it I mean, and this is all in my model. I mean, it, it does depend on the gross margins, the operating margins. You know, Zoom has very very strong margins. You know, when they came public, one of the reasons that they got such a a lofty price to sales multiple that very first day of trading is because they were already public. I mean, they were mm-hmm. already profitable versus mm-hmm. all these other you know. Uh, SaaS companies or cloud companies coming public that were, you know, losing huge amounts of money still. So, I mean, Zoom, so or already, you know, or always been in that, you know, that profitable camp, which I think means, I think they can get added to the S&P 500 pretty soon. Because hmm. um, I think they've been public now for at least four quarters, and I believe they've been profitable every quarter. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we could get that announcement probably anytime. I'm assuming they're not going to, I mean, they won't, they're obviously not going to do it this year. And I mean, I think these indexes are probably still digesting Tesla. Yeah. Um, so maybe they wait another quarter or two, but I would assume sometime in 2021, we'll see Zoom get added to the S&P 500. 
Um, I think Shopify will be eligible, although because they're a Canadian based company, I'm not sure they're allowed to go in. Mm -hmm. So, but that'd be interesting. What, interesting one to watch too. But yeah, I mean, so this is what I'm trying, this is what I've been doing the last couple of months is trying to figure out of all the stocks I own, which ones can keep putting up big numbers, which ones have these massive runs. And even though the, the, the price to sales multiple still look reasonable, like mm -hmm. I, I just, I, st I have to try to put myself in like the shoes of these big fund managers and you know, like what's their thinking, what's this, what's like the, the, the sentiment out there and how many of them want to keep owning these COVID winners versus rotating into these other, you know, the other sectors and industries that, you know, might benefit more from an economic rebound, from more stimulus, from, you know, a big infrastructure bill, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I own CrowdStrike and I think you do too as well. Yep. And I mean, that, that could be considered a COVID play, but I, I think it's a little bit more than that because, I mean, cybersecurity is going to get more and more important. I mean, we've seen in the news recently all this stuff that's gone, uh, that's come out about this. I mean, and this company is disruptive, growing at an incredibly fast rate using AI. Uh, and yeah, this is a very promising holding, even though it's short-term extended here, definitely. Um, I, I still have a half position, so I'll look to add off the 21 EMA or, or if it pulls back even more um, at another good low risk entry. But uh, this is an example of, something that's considered a COVID play, but I think has a longer uh, longer time horizon, I think is going to be a very, very good winner. Yep, me too. So the last couple of days, you know, Monday and Tuesday, when I got hammered in the market, you know, I did make some moves. I mean, that's when I sold my Peloton. That's when I sold my Etsy. And then I added it to CrowdStrike, added to C Limited, added to Square, because I think these companies are not just COVID winners. I think these companies will keep that revenue going. And like you said, I mean, we're living in a world now where, you know, we're all spending more time on our phones and our laptops and work from home and cybersecurity, you know, the need for cybersecurity is not going away anytime soon. So mm -hmm. now I would love to find a smaller version of CrowdStrike, but it seems like all the other cybersecurity companies that I look at that are smaller have half the growth rate of CrowdStrike. Mm -hmm. So it's like, even though CrowdStrike is a $45 billion company, they're still growing faster than everybody else in there because they're just that yeah. much better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cause I, not that I'm not that I don't want to own any large cap companies anymore, but I, I just feel myself kind of getting pulled towards those smaller cap companies if they're growing faster than the larger cap companies. But mm -hmm. if, if the, you know, like Shopify, right. I mean, big, big commerce is, you know, a fraction of the, the market cap of Shopify but Shopify is growing three times faster. So yep. if I get back into that, you know, that e-commerce SaaS space, I would rather own Shopify than big than big commerce for that reason. So, and you can kind of see that in the in the charts. I mean, if you pull oh up Shopify God. versus Big C, you can see which company the big institutions are going for here. I mean, Shopify already had a crazy run, a nice long term base, and now it's just starting to show some movement once again. Yep. So I. This one was frustrating. I mean, I forget. I mean, I've been in and out of this name a few times this year um, and <laughs> all these times where I was adding here, you know, and then you, you'd start to see this breakout and you think you'd, you know, you're going up to 14, you know, 1300, 1400, and then you get that nasty pullback under 900. So mm -hmm. I just, and then, I mean, this happened a few times, right? I mean, this was a very frustrating sideways pattern. Um, so I finally sold it right around 1200 the other day because <laughs> I just, I didn't, I didn't want to get screwed on another pullback and, and watch that position, watch my gains uh, disappear again. So I'm actually hoping this one comes back and tests the 20 day. I'd probably get back in. Um, Cause I, I mean, I do still love this name going forward. I think that, you know, the four ways to win, right. I mean, they have the, the monthly fees, they charge their customers, the, you know, the payment fees or the transaction fees, the app store. And then now they're getting into, uh, you know, fulfillment and logistics. So, I mean, I yep. think this, I think this company is going to be a beast for the next decade or so, but I just, I, I don't want to chase it. It feels like it, it still has to kind of digest that $140 billion valuation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How I see it is I wouldn't have really been looking to trade it until if you draw a line from the 31st of August, that high. August 31st, where's that? Uh, so up, yep. if you go up a little bit. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, from right from the high of that bar and just draw it across. Um, yeah, anyway, I, I would have been looking for a breakout of this line, maybe, maybe draw it a downward trend line. 
or that earlier consolidation. I don't, I don't draw a lot. Breaks out. I don't draw a lot of lines as you can yeah. tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't know what's, huh? Okay. Yeah. But for a swing trader, position trader, I do not want to be chopped up in the space. I want to make sure it's making a longer term move before I try looking for a position. And so, this to me just look, looks like it's pulling back to the pivot beautifully. And uh, I'll probably, I'll probably look for an entry on this stock actually. Where would, so would you wait for it to find support on the 20 day? Well, it's very close to the 20 day and also the high of this base, which is, which is that high point at around the 31st of right. August. So okay. uh, this, this would be a pretty good spot to start building a position and uh, maybe it undercuts that pivot level and, and retakes it on a high volume. That would be a buy or if it just kind of continues to move up to move up from here, because that moving average is just kind of an area of interest for me. It's not, it doesn't have to fall right to that moving average. Right. It's just kind of a guideline of the trend. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be watching this closely um, next week into the new year. Now, do you look at the fundamentals as well? I mean, do you care what Shopify's revenue growth or margins are for 2021? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm mostly concerned with the earnings estimates for 2021. Okay. And I want to see those to be the higher, the better. Over 100% ideal. I mean, GRWG, Peloton, those are all over 100% earnings, right. according right. to MarketSmith. So that's great. I also look at the most recent quarter, how it did in terms of earnings and sales growth and all of that. Um, and Shopify, I mean, has great numbers overall. And it's a great story, like you said. What's one stock that, you, that you've added recently? Uh, well, today I I can, I, I can pull it up. Yeah, so today I added to um, let's see. Well, I started back my position in AMD actually. Okay, I'll bring that up. That's been a, a nice winner, kicking kicking Intel's ass. Yep, yep. And I I, I actually also bought Neo. Um, so we can talk about that after this one. Um, so recently, if you scroll, if you zoom in a little bit to the recent action. It moved up from this nice double bottom base and I built up a position and then sold um, as it undercut some um, some levels up recently. But I put my position back on as it had a nice reversal yesterday and then a nice move above that high today. And then I can enter today with a stop loss below yesterday's low with a very good uh, small stop. So that's gotcha. kind of uh, so my stop is right below that low. If I get stopped up, uh, stopped out, it's a small loss. If it keeps right. going, that's fine. Um, by the way, do you use stop losses at all when, on your um, positions? Yeah, I do sometimes. I mean, typically, like you said, on a new position where, you know, especially if if it is kind of hugging that the Bollinger Band on the way up mm -hmm. and I'm afraid it might, you know, might break down, um, I'll use a stop loss to, to protect myself. But I, I'm not big on them um, and I'm definitely not big on them on core positions where if it pulls back, I'm just most likely to add to it anyways, mm -hmm. you know, cause I mean, sometimes these stocks can just reverse so quickly. Um, and even like after hours, I mean, I, I it's happened to me before where you'll, you'll use a stop loss and the company will, will report earnings and you get that, like that quick drop within a couple seconds, your stop loss gets triggered. And then within 15 minutes, it's trading, you know, it's trading 10% higher. So I feel like more often than not, the stop losses hurt me more than help me. So I, I, I watch my stocks so closely all day long as it is. Um, mm -hmm. And even though, I mean, even though I have more positions than you, I just don't feel like I typically need a stop loss. So. Gotcha. I uh, go ahead and bring up Neo. Yeah. Cause this, this is another one that I bought just today. This is uh, this was a new name for me a couple days ago. Yeah. So I love the reversal action yesterday off the 50 day moving average that that would have been the ideal setup. Um, I wasn't watching it close enough, but today as it took out um, the prior day's high, as well as the day before's high, that was kind of the pivot point for me. So I put on a position and I'll add if it takes out that kind of swing high at about um, just below 50. So the 21st of De December, it forms that kind of swing high, pulls back to the 50. And I'll add through that point. Gotcha. So, so where would you put a stop loss on? Yeah. So today I put a stop um, below the 21 EMA and today's low. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Up, up around there. Yeah. So I forget right that. Here, like 45. Yeah. So, okay. 45 area. Yeah. I mean, so my, my cost basis on Neo right now is, uh, where's Neo? So 4705. So yeah. So I started buying it. I think I started buying it right around here. 
Mm -hmm. thinking that, you know, it would, it would continue this way. <laughs> and obviously we got a little bit of a reversal. So, I mean, I was just kind of adding this whole way down. Um, mm -hmm. ho hopefully now we get the, the breakout to new highs that I've been hoping for. So I'm trying to think, I think the all, let's see the all time high on this is, um, so 50, Rug. 56. Mm -hmm. So is this the all time high right here? Yeah. Okay. So yep. November 24th. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to buy as close to that kind of reversal point as possible um, okay. off off these swing lows. Now, do you stick with any particular sectors? Um, I'm looking for how I find stocks. I'm looking for earnings growth, sales growth primarily, earnings estimates, and then I I'm, and usually those are tech companies. So that's kind of what I'm focused on. And Neo is a name I've traded a lot this year. It, it's it's been pretty easy to trade. Breaks out very nicely on high volume. Um, hopefully it does so again, but I mean, EV is a very strong theme. This has come quite a ways. So, um, right. it might be a little bit more obvious. The general public might need a longer digestion period, kind of what we're seeing with zoom here. Uh, but I mean, overall it's setting up nicely. It's doing nothing wrong. Great reversal action off the 50 day kind of textbook, um, support there. And yeah, hopefully it breaks out above that kind of, um, that kind of level around 48, 50. And this is what scares me because I pull up my my portfolio and one of the columns is year to date change, and yeah. I I can put it in, I can put it in order. I mean Neo is up eleven hundred percent this year, right? I mean yep. this was like a two dollar stock back in March, I think two or three dollars. I mean Celsius now is up nine hundred percent year to date. Grow Generation is up nine hundred percent year to date. So like it's just common sense to be like okay that. You know, it's overvalued. I mean, if if a stock goes up nine hundred percent, and but the revenues haven't gone up nine hundred percent, like there's a disconnect there, right? You know, you, you obviously got a lot of multiple contraction, or mm -hmm. you know, you got pull forward or whatever it might be. But then, like, I look at the current valuation. I do think Celsius is getting a little frothy here, but you know, if I look at Grow Generation, I mean, it's tri it's a little over two billion market cap. They should do over three hundred million dollars a year in sales. So it's under seven times sales with a 60% growth rate. Like that's not, that's not unreasonable. You know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't strike me as being really frothy or overvalued right now. So I just, I have to, I, I try not to pay too much attention to that year to date change, especially because this was such a, you know, 2020 was just bananas um, yeah. with the pandemic and all the stimulus and zero, you know, zero interest rates. Like, you know, this was not a normal year. <laughs> Absolutely. And kind of what I go by is winners usually keep winning. Obviously that ends at a point, but I'd right. rather be invested in these stocks that are their their industries are booming. They're benefiting from the current situations. Uh, there's this theme is going to continue, whether it's solar, um, electric vehicles, uh, cybersecurity, it's going to continue for the next decade or so. And these are the leaders in the field at this point, and they're well positioned to benefit and that's kind of what why they're trading this way and, and under such strong accumulation. Right. I mean, I, one of the screens I will never do is the 52 week low list. Right. I mean, I'm absolutely. Not, absolutely. I'm not going out there trying to pick pick the bottom in broken companies or broken industries. I mean, that's you know, I guess that's what the value managers are doing, you know, trying to find those turnaround stories. Uh, that's not what I'm doing. I mean, not that I'm looking for the stocks at the 52 week highs but I'm more likely to buy stocks that are closer to the highs than the lows. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Could you bring up Fastly for just a second? Because I think uh, this is a good, this is a, this, I mean, this, I, one, this one hurts. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Same here. Um, so I've traded this a couple of times, gotten screwed a couple of times, but I think this last gap down is a good example of. Um, I'm going to turn the, off the Bollinger Bands because they're just getting in the way. Yeah, no problem. But I think it's a good example of kind of my mentality as a, as a swing position trader versus maybe an investor. Uh, so I started building a position near the, the 50 day and as it moved up um, and it was, it, was, it was going up like 35% in a week before this most recent gap down. And then obviously we had the gap down with the news with, with regards to TikTok and I cut it pretty much right at the open. I watched a little bit to see how it would react, but I cut it pretty much right there. Uh, while an investor might sit through that drawdown but also kind of waste a little bit of time there because they could invest that capital into well, maybe a different stock that would go up. Um, so yeah, how, what, what do you kind of think about when you have a huge gap down like that well, as an investor? I mean, that was painful. So, I mean, right, when they talk about catching a falling knife, I mean, this is like um, exhibit A, 
So, I mean, I first got into Fastly way back in the early springtime. You know, I mm-hmm. took a small position, two or three percent, probably back in April. I might have even gotten it in March. I forget. And, you know, when it was in like the 30s, I think, you know, and, and you know, as I became more comfortable with it, um, you know, who their customers were, you know, believe that they'd be a huge pandemic winner, COVID winner. You know, I was adding to the position, you know, the whole way up, you know, look, looking good, feeling good. Um, and then we got this sell off where, you know, we first got that, you know, the, the Trump administration saying that TikTok would would be banned if they didn't meet certain you know requirements. And I mean, I was reckless back then. And I said, oh, that's stupid. They're not going to ban TikTok. They'll figure this thing out. And I loaded up on TikTok um, and it became like a 40, 50, 60 percent position in my portfolio for a couple of days, maybe even a couple of weeks you know, rode this thing up to almost back to a hundred. Uh, and then thank, that's when I started trimming it down and then added it back, you know, uh, built that position back up again in September, rode it all the way up. And I think, uh, I think when it sold off here, I think the position was down to about 10 or 11% maybe. So that drop, you know, it did hurt. Um, I, I think I might've added a little bit after hours, um, and then I laid off for a couple of days. I think I trimmed it. And then around here, I started adding it back in again. But I mean, I think even with all of this, I think I still made money on Fastly this year, but that drop hurt. I mean, that was, yeah. that was the, that was the only month this year that I don't think I posted my performance numbers for the month because <laughs> they were so ugly <laughs> yeah. from that one drop. So I mean, that just, I mean, I think that was a lesson to me that, you know, keep positioned under 10% um, or, you know, clearly this is when a stop loss would have helped me. Um, well, not so much on the gap down. You can't do much about the, right, the gap down. Right. Yeah. I mean, that thing's going to open the next day. Um, God, I mean, so I, I feel bad and, and this is, I mean, there's no way for me to control this or prevent it, but you know, when I, and this is just, this is the world we live in now with FinTwit and people trying to be transparent. You know, when I post my portfolio and someone saw that my largest position was Fastly, you know, some of them might interpret that incorrectly and think, oh, Jonah still loves Fastly. Jonah's adding to Fastly up here where I hadn't added to Fastly, you know, since like around here, I was mm-hmm. trimming the whole way up. But mm-hmm. other people, you know, they just follow each other into trades. They see, you know, so-and-so loves this stock. So I'm going to add it to my portfolio. So I mean, there were probably people out there buying Fastly at 130. I mean, this Fastly had no business being up at 130, even with TikTok. I don't mm-hmm. think that I don't think that stock should have been at 130. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that that sell off was, I mean, it was justified because you lose your biggest customer, you lose 12 percent of your revenues. Uh, you know, the entire story changes. So, you know, instead of doing 500 million dollars this year, you know, you might be lucky to do you know, 450 or instead of doing 450, you might be lucky to do 410, something like that. So, yep, that was a, that was a brutal one. So, I mean, I know one of the questions you were going to ask me was my best trade and my worst trade. I mean, the stock I made the most money on this year was Tesla. Mm -hmm. And the stock that I lost the most money on was, I don't know. I mean, this, this was a huge loser, but I still think if I added up all the money I made along the way from trimming fastly, I think it was still more than what I lost that day. Um, but that was, I mean, if I had to pick like a, you know, my worst day of the year, that, that was it right there. Um, gotcha. I'm trying to think, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I had a few stocks this year. So at one point I did own, um, I had a small position in the springtime in smart sheet. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I had like a two or three percent position when this drop happened. So that, you know, and then I, I cut it, I cut it right away. I was, I was out the next day. Um, I had a small position in this one, mm-hmm. Arcturus. That just dropped like a rock very oh recently. Oh my God. Yeah. So I had 50%. It, yep. I had it back here in like May. Mm-hmm. So I think I had a one or two percent, one or two percent position when it, when that drop happened. So, I mean, it was painful, but like it was such a tiny position in the portfolio. It didn't, I mean, this one's been, I mean, this one has just been a, I mean, look at these drops there, 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 but then this rally, like, I mean, you could have made a ton of money on this stock, but then, I mean, if, so I know ARC, this was like a big position for ARC in their, I think, genomics portfolio. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that ETF, ARKG, was down, I think, 6 or 7% yesterday because of this position. So, 
Yeah, fifty percent. It's almost almost sixty percent, right? From a hundred. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. And and overall, I'm looking for stocks that have a history of gap ups, not these gap downs, because right. <laughs> I. I because I find, I mean, you're much more likely to have a gap up if there's been some recent gap ups. I mean, GRWG started a lot of these great stocks. Yeah, pins start with a huge gap up. And this is often a good entry point uh, right when all those institutions are piling in. I mean, you had to sit through that. Um, and I was training this within that. But this is a sign that institutions have changed their mind and, and maybe are underweight in a stock that they, they have to buy. So I remember I got into Pinterest right after this gap up when you did a video on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that got me into it. And I'm, I've been holding it ever since. I mean, I've, you know, I've trimmed it a couple of times along the way. Um, but I mean, it's still a three or three and a half percent position in my portfolio. So, you know, I mean, and there's, there's no, there's really no reason for me to sell it yet. I mean, not, you know, I mean, they're still looking for 50% revenue growth this year. Um, you know, expanding margins. I know they, they send a lot of business over to Etsy. Um, and then you throw in the Bollinger Bands. Yep. So, I mean, it's really, I mean, other than this, this big pop here, I mean, it really hasn't given you any reason to trim along the way. So, I mean, I've just sort of, I haven't really trimmed from what the Bollinger Bands have told me. I've more or less just trimmed, you know, just, I don't know, when it got into the seventies last week, I just felt like it was due for a pullback and it just had such a, a nice run. So I think I sold some around, you know, right around here for 72, 73 range. But I mean, if it, if it gets back down here, I'd probably start to add it again. I'd probably, you know, if it gets back down to like 65, um, mm -hmm. I'd probably start to add, add it back. So you use technicals a lot more than I guess I, I, I was thinking you did because you're, you're looking at these where it's extended or pulling back to the, this potential support areas. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I don't use it. I don't use them as much as you do probably, mm -hmm. but I, I think the more that I use them, the better, the better it makes me. Um, yeah especially with, you know, I think especially as we, as so this year, right. I mean, almost any of my growth stocks that I trimmed, I ended up regretting it because most of them just kept on marching higher. Mm -hmm. um, but even when you're trimming a position, you know, oftentimes you're taking the, the proceeds from that sale and you're adding it somewhere else. I mean, it's not like it's just sitting in cash and collecting dust. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, as I say, I mean, you know, while some stocks are zigging, other stocks are zagging. So, you know, as one stock might be, you know, poking through the Bollinger Band and, you know, uh, needing a trim, another stock might be bouncing off a 20 day or 50 day moving average and ready to get some additional capital added to it. So that's kind of how I try to play it, right? Try to trim, trim the stocks that are getting frothy, add to the stocks that are, you know, pulling back to some support and just kind of moving capital around that way. And, you know, over the course of a year, I think you could add a lot of alpha that way. So. Absolutely. And do you mind bringing up your, your spreadsheet where you talk, you have all your weights for your positions? Cause I do, cause I do want to ask you about how you decide what weight to give a difference each stock. And um, I guess you talked about your, your kind of moonshot positions, which were just kind of tokens. So you're keeping an eye on it, but how do you decide which is a core position in your stock? and which maybe has only a three, 5% uh, allocation. So, I mean, my moonshots. So I, <laughs> I go in and out of moonshots. I mean, one week I get all excited about these, these moonshot companies, and then we get a sell off and I think, okay, crap, I need that capital to, you know, go add to my higher conviction name. So then I end up, you know, selling off the moonshots and taking that money and, and adding it to, you know, CrowdStrike, C Limited, Square, et cetera. And I mean, at some point I might get out of the habit of that, but at least right now I feel like, I don't know, that's just, that, that works. That strategy works better for me when, when times get tough, I need to bet on, on the, on the stocks that I have the most conviction in. Um, but so a couple names, a couple smaller names I added today. I mean, you can see the bottom of the portfolio. I mean, these are, mm -hmm. I'm not even sure if they're a 10th of a percent, to be honest. I didn't even do the math. I just added them in here. Um, so these are stocks that I'm, I'm doing some due diligence on right now that were mentioned. Uh, you know, when I posted on Twitter last night, I was looking for some new stock ideas for my newsletter. These are five or six of the names that came through out of the two or 300 that people mentioned that I thought looked the most interesting. So mm -hmm. I, I did some due diligence last night. I did some due diligence this morning on these names. 
So I took very, very tiny positions just to get them on my main screen, like I said earlier, so I can start to see them add, you know, start to see them trade throughout the day, maybe add some limit orders on a couple of them. I think a couple of these names like Clean Spark um, uh, had a little bit of a pullback today. So CFII, I'm not even sure what that stands for. It's obviously a SPAC, um, but they're merging with View Glass. So I, I've known View Glass for many, many years just because when I was doing SoundGuard, um, mm-hmm. you, you know, you're you're sort of in the construction industry. So you talk to a lot of architects and designers. You come across all these other products that are, you know, being adopted by the industry. And that was a name that kind of always stood out to me. So I hope someday they could go public. And I think this is just, this is one of those stocks that if you want to, it's a play on the, not just the, I guess you could say the rebounding of the economy, but also like the rebound in new construction. So, I mean, if you go to their website, you can see what they do. I mean, they, it's like, I think they actually, I think they actually call it like AI powered glass. Um, I need to read up more on that, but it's, it's like, it's like self tinting glass. Hmm. So it's, it's smart glass. Um, the idea being that, you know, when, when the, the sun's out, you know, these, these windows yeah. are going to like tint themselves. So you don't need shades. Um, they're super energy efficient. So, um, I mean, I think there was one example on the website where I, I don't know how big the building was, but it said it would cost, I think $3 million to install, you know, these, the, the view glass, uh, you know, across the entire building. And over the next, like, I don't know if it's 10, 20, 30 years, they would save like $30 million, wow. uh, you know, just in heating and cooling expenses and then not having to, you know, purchase all the blinds for all the windows. So, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a much nicer, cleaner look as well. Like if you don't have to have these big, ugly blinds on every window mm-hmm. and you can have like this self tinting smart glass, um, it's pretty cool. So yeah, that's I, cool. You know, I think over the next, you know, two, three years as the economy rebounds, as we start to see new construction come back, you know, that's the type of company that might benefit from it. So I might be getting a little bit early, but I usually say I'd rather get in early than late. So. Absolutely. And if you don't mind going back to Trend Spider, I, I do want to ask about how you handle drawdowns. And I want to hear uh, specifically how you handled the March crash, whether you raise cash, right. um, trim uh- your positions. So I'll just say, I mean, so I would say, generally speaking, I mean, the, the larger the allocation of my portfolio, it's typically a combination of like, you know, how bullish I am on that stock, but also how like defensive it is, I guess, in terms of like, if we get a big pullback in the markets, I think that stock will hold up better. Gotcha. You know, even though I think Mohawk and you know, let's go through here, Upstart and a couple of these other smaller stocks might return you know, might put up bigger returns in 2021. If we saw a correction, I would expect them to pull back way more than mm-hmm. like a CrowdStrike or a Square or a C Limited. So, you know, I have to try to keep that in mind. Like if we do get a drawdown or pullback, you know, which of these stocks is going to hold up the best while also still giving me some upside in a bull market. So. Gotcha. Um, and what's your psychology during a, a crash or a huge drawdown? How do, how do you look at that minus 6% on the day or whatever it is <laughs> and uh, make sure you're staying objective and following whatever plan you set out and, and make sure you're, um, you're managing your portfolio the right way, basically? So that's a good question. I mean, it, it definitely depends, um, you know, because I went through the financial crisis 10 or 11 years ago. I think I, rem- I remember how bad it was and how prolonged it was. So I was actually expecting that in March, mm-hmm. um, you know, as they shut everything down, as the gym was closed, as nobody's traveling. And I'm thinking like, holy shit, the economy is going to get freaking hammered. The stock market is going to get hammered. Like I remember the S and P going down 55% in the financial crisis. And I thought, you know, this could be like worse than that, right? I mean, who knows how bad this pandemic is going to get? Who knows when they're going to actually get to reopen things? I mean, God knows how many jobs are going to be lost, how many restaurants are going to close down. I mean, I didn't think 11 months later we'd still be dealing with this, to be honest. Um, But I also knew that the average time for a vaccine to come to market was many, many years, not many, many months. So I was mostly out of the market in March. I mean, I was pretty much all cash as the market was collapsing because I thought, and there's actually text messages that I was sending to my, my buddies at Fidelity. And I'm like, dude, the S and P is going down to like 1600 watch. 
So I thought we were going way farther down than we went because I didn't expect Powell to come in so quickly and inject all of that money and stabilize the credit markets. So I was basically out of the markets in cash. So when the mock, when the market bottomed, and I can bring up the SPY. Uh, let's go back. Turn off the Bollinger Bands. Yeah, I mean, so I forget when I got out. I mean, I got out pretty early. So maybe maybe somewhere around here, like late February. I mean, and then by the time this, this thing bottomed, I think, I don't think I got back in until early April. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I missed, I clearly missed the bottom here. It rallied, came back down. And then I think that's when I got in somewhere around in the first week in April. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, I mean, this was also when I was, so I was running my company full time up until then, you know, mm -hmm. I was 50, 60, 70 hours a week, whatever it was. I mean, I was busy, you know, running SoundGuard, managing sales reps, you know, talking to architects every day, talking to the dealers every day. I was not doing a lot in my stock portfolio. I was not, you know, set up with multiple screens, you know, trading my positions, you know, spending hours and hours of, of research and, and technicals. I, I wasn't doing any of that because I was mm -hmm. focused on my company and trying to build a, you know, 20, 30, $40 million company at the time. And then once it became clear, you know, right around here, <laughs> like within a couple, couple of weeks of this thing, you know, starting and the lockdowns happening, it became pretty clear that my company was not going to come through this very well. So, you know, I, all my sales reps were basically terminated at that point. Um, you know, I could tell, I mean, the, the calls from the dealers stopped coming in, you know, cause construction was freezing up and, you know, I'm, I'm emailing the hotel people and I'm getting emails back that say I'm furloughed for the next six months or whatever it is. I'm like, Oh my God, this, this, this is going to be bad. So I pretty much knew at that point that SoundGuard may not make it through this, or if it did, it would take, you know, a while for it to actually recover. So down here is when I actually started. I'm like, okay, I got to start putting more time into my, into my investment portfolio because my income for the year just disappeared. So the only way I'm going to be making any money this year is from my stock portfolio. So I actually pulled some money out of my company that was just sitting in cash doing nothing since like, if the company's not going to be doing anything, there's no expenses, no one has to get paid. So I might as well pull some money out, actually pay myself a salary and put that into my investment portfolio. So I was paying, I started paying myself like every few days out of my account, adding to my investment portfolio, and then just, you know, trying to kind of pick up where I left off, you know, literally 10 years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. I really, I really was not that active in my investment portfolio the last eight, nine, 10 years. Cause I was so busy doing other things, you know, trying to run, trying to grow businesses, raise capital and all that. So, you know, it's been the last, you know, 10, 11 months that I really got back into this seriously. Um, but I mean, I, I obviously have a, a background in the business. Absolutely. Yeah. For, for me, I, I think I was able to get out pretty close to where you did just because it was breaking those key moving averages and there are distribution days, which is kind of a can slim term for um, big drops in the indexes on high volume piling up. So there, there are the signs that there could be something like this. We didn't know how deep it was going to go. Uh, and then we actually had the fall through day signal um, right basically where you ended up getting back in right after that second kind of pullback. So that's very interesting that we're kind of lining up on those timeframes. So uh, one, of, one of the things, <laughs> one of the things I did around here, which actually worked out very well is I bought that. I, FNGU. I, yep. Yeah. <laughs> the, the three X leveraged, uh, you know, the FANG ETF, uh, you know, with Tesla and Facebook and Google, Amazon, Apple, uh, NVIDIA. And I, Oh, NVIDIA. Yep. And then Baba and Baidu. So I wrote that thing. I mean, at one point, I think it was like as much as a third of my portfolio. Um, but I mean, I think I wrote that. So this is, this is where I made a mistake where I got into that, you know, call it a five or 10% allocation in April. And then obviously it just became a bigger part of my portfolio as it rallied. But, you know, I let it, I let it rally all the way up to this point and I didn't, you know, I hadn't trimmed it at all. So I got hammered and then hammered again, let it rally, got hammered. So, and like, I rode that whole, I rode it all the way down. So um, I, I used it to make some money, but I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, 
I don't know. I didn't manage that position as well as I probably should have. So that was a, that was a lesson learned as well. What's your mentality when, when you suffer those big pullbacks, what are you, what are you thinking? Um, I mean, I'd like to say that I learn a lesson from each one, Mm -hmm. although I think some of, I mean, (laughs) the lessons we should learn, um, I don't know, are always so obvious at the time, or at least not obvious enough or painful enough that we don't make them again. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wasn't using any margin mm-hmm. in this in this rally because uh, I was just afraid of a, another big leg down in the markets. And I'm just I'm still surprised that we never got it. I mean, I'm still surprised that we I thought we were going to come down and retest these lows at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm shocked that we didn't. So there was no way I was going to use margin, you know, with with that thought in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I. I was still pretty bullish, you know, as the the Fed and the Treasury got more aggressive with their, you know, their fiscal packages and whatnot. I felt like the markets were going to rally. And then, you know, as it became pretty obvious that our pandemic winners, our cloud stocks, our e-commerce stocks were, you know, really, really disrupting these industries. um, I stayed pretty bullish. So I I did start using margin uh, somewhere probably early summer. Um, so when that September sell-off happened, uh, I got hammered pretty hard because I was on margin. Um, and I kept saying myself, okay, if I get back on margin or if I leverage up again, I'm not going to let myself get to that point where everything looks frothy. I'm levered up on margin and I'm just asking for another, you know, nasty pullback. So I did learn my lesson and, you know, we got that big pullback. I mean, the Pfizer pullback was sort of, I mean, there was no escaping that. I mean, doesn't matter if you want margin or not, you know, when, when that Pfizer vaccine vaccine news came on that Monday morning, I mean, gross, I mean, Peloton was down 20%. I mean, that was just zoom was probably down 15 or 20%. I mean, that was an, that was an ugly day. There was nowhere to hide for growth stock. So, um, but even over the past two months, you know, I've managed my margin pretty well where, you know, I, I don't let, I don't let my ego get ahead of myself. I don't let my positions, like I said, get too frothy. Um, so, but I mean, I, the other thing is I try to, <laughs> um, you know, as I've been able to generate some income for myself and I have, and as I have money coming into my account every week or every other week, I don't mind the pullback so much because like if I have money and I know I have a big chunk of cash coming in next week, like even though the sell off the last two days hurts my, you know, month to date performance, my year to date performance, the fact that I have a chunk of cash coming in next week, part of me almost hopes that the market does pull back another five or 10% before that cash comes in so that I get to mm-hmm. buy some of my favorite stocks at cheaper prices. So, and I mean, I mean, you know this too. I mean, any good bull market needs to have some breathers along the way. You need to get some pull out pullbacks. You need to get some washouts. So, I mean, I, I look at pullbacks as just at least up until now, you know, over the past six, nine months as just, healthy, normal corrections, um, you know, a little bit of, uh, re, you know, a dose of reality for all those new investors that don't know what a pullback looks like or how, you know, painful it can feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think FinTwit is a good example of when you start to see all the rocket emojis coming out on FinTwit, you, you know, it's time for a pullback. <laughs> yep. So. Absolutely. And I, I think we're, we're getting down to the end of it here. This has been great. I guess uh, the last main question I want to ask you was, um, are there any either technical or fundamental red flags that you watch out for when it comes to your positions? So something that would just make you exit the next day or or something like that. Um, Not, not technical. Mm -hmm. Um, So RT, even, even given a drop like that, uh, you, which, which one? Um, ARCT, oh, the one that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, and so this is one reason I've, I I'm no longer even going near this industry, right? I mean, back when the, you know, the whole, you know, there was a race to find the vaccine, and nobody knew, you know, would it be Moderna? Would it be, you know, one of these therapeutic companies? So I owned mm-hmm. a few. I owned a few of them. Um, I owned Inno, I N O. I mm-hmm. owned Moderna. I owned, you know, um, I can't even pronounce the name Ar- Arcturus. So I owned three or four of them, you know, as like one or 2% positions each just to try to, you know, play that, that vaccine development. And then after ARCT burned me, 
I'm like, you know what? And I, I mean, I did make some money on Inno and Moderna, but I sold, I mean, I, I sold them way too early. Um, I think I got into Moderna back in like March or, well, I guess not really March because it was out of the market, but April, probably somewhere, mm-hmm. somewhere in here. I probably got into Moderna somewhere in like the, the low to mid thirties. And then I got out of it like right around here. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, clearly the stock has doubled from, you know, almost tripled from that point. So, you know, I did leave some money on the table, but I felt like it just wasn't worth it. I mean, there was 10 or 15 companies going after the vaccine, you know, no one knew who was going to get there first. You know, there was just months and months of development and trials and, you know, FDA approvals. And at the same time, like, are these companies even going to make any money on the vaccine? And look what happened to Moderna, right? I mean, Moderna, yep. after they got approval, like, look what's happened to the stock since. So it was like, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news, like perfect example of buy the rumor, sell the news. You write it all the way up. And then as soon as everything, everything good is out there, everyone sells it like just crazy. So I've just realized that. I'm not the right person to pick biotech or pharmaceutical stocks under any circumstances. So I have approximately three or 4% of my portfolio in ARKG. And I would just rather have Kathy and her team at ARK manage that chunk of my portfolio. And I can focus on other industries that I'm more familiar with. So yeah, they're fantastic over there. Yep. Definitely. Great job. I mean, I follow them on Twitter. I read some of their research, but like when it comes to, you know, genomics and all this other stuff, I, I don't understand it. Gene editing, gene testing. I mean, I think it's cool. I think it could be the future. So I want to be, I want to be in it, but mm-hmm. I'm not, I, I don't want to be picking my own positions. I don't want to decide whether I should be owning, you know, Editas or Twist or, you know, one of these other, you know, Flugion. Um, I mean, there's so many of them out there now. I can't even keep track. And most Absolutely. of them, most of them, I mean, a lot of them aren't even, you know, they're not even generating revenue yet and none mm-hmm. of them are profitable. So it's mm-hmm. like, you know, these are all very, very speculative companies by themselves, which is another reason I'd rather own them as an ETF. So that you get that, you know, that diversification. So, you know, you're at least able to manage your risk that way because I mean, look what just happened to ARCT, right? I mean, it just dropped 50, 60%. So if that was like your one biotech or genomics company, you know, you just got your ass handed to you. So. Absolutely. And what, what about fundamental, like uh, management change or the company announces they're, they're changing directions Would that? Uh, so would that change your thesis in the company and that would that um, change your allocation? I mean, so I'm just trying to think of examples this year where something material changed with the story and the, or the fundamentals. I mean, the one that obviously comes to mind is Fastly, right? I mean, when you lose your biggest customer um, mm-hmm. through no fault of their own, right? I mean, Fastly didn't do anything wrong to lose TikTok. That was just strictly a political battle between Trump and China. So it sucks that Fastly and their shareholders had to take the brunt of that. But I mean, that's just, that's the way it goes sometimes. So, you know, certainly that changed the story for me where Fastly is, mm, let's see, it's one, two, three. Um, I don't think it's in my top 10 anymore. Oh, actually, I can, let me see. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, so it's, I mean, so it's like number 12 or 13 in my portfolio. So, I mean, you know, this summer, obviously, and then leading to the fall, it was my, you know, it was a top three position for many, many months. But it's just once the story changes that dramatically, um, you know, if, it's, if a CE, uh, I mean, it depends. Like, I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, I'm not in Tesla anymore. So I'm just trying to think if something happened to Elon Musk or he decided to, you know, uh, go to Africa and disappear or something. I mean, I guess that would probably change the story. Although I don't know if it would get, I mean, these large companies, I mean, they're in most cases, no one person is bigger than the company anyways. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if the CEO of, you know, C limited Forrest Lee decided to step down, I mean, as long as he's, you know, as long as he promised not to sell his shares, right. I mean, that's a little bit different if the CEO decides to step down and they own a huge chunk of the company and there's the thought that they might liquidate all their shares that Mm -hmm. could, you know, that could create a lot of pressure on the stock. So, in that case, I'd probably be out. But, you know, I mean, if, if there's if there's some indication that there's going to be a, a huge drop off in revenues, um, you know, where some product or whatever is, is discontinued. I mean, like I said, I don't get into like pharmaceutical. I don't get into I get into medical devices a little bit. So, I mean, that would change. That would obviously change. Like so Nanox Nanox is one of my you know, I call moonshot companies, right? I mean, they're pre-revenue right now. They need mm-hmm. to get they need to get FDA approval for their machines. 
you know, if suddenly we wake up tomorrow morning and it finds out that they got denied FDA approval, I mean, the stock would probably be down 50% because of it. But at that point, I'd probably just cut my losses and get out. So. Gotcha. Awesome. All right. So the last question I always ask is, uh, do you have any motivating words for new traders slash investors? Uh, what can new investors do to shorten the learning curve? Good question. I, and I know you were going to ask the book and podcast, uh, the book, the book question too. I mean, oh yeah. I, I mean, I'll be honest. I don't read a lot of investment books over the years. I've never really found a lot that you know kind of persuaded me. I suppose. I mean, one book I did read recently or listen to on audio was uh, Chris Mayer's book, A Hundred Baggers. So that's pretty good. It's on Audible. I think it's like 15 or 16 bucks. Uh, it's a pretty easy listen. And there's, there's some good stuff in there. I mean, one of the, the examples that he uses that I really like is Monster. So Monster Beverage, and this is one reason I own Celsius, but Monster Beverage has been, I think, one of the three or four best performing stocks over the last 20 years. And I mean, the, it's up like 100,000%, literally. Yep. It's like ridiculous. But over, I think there was a... 10 year period where it was a hundred bagger over 10 years. But in that 10 year period, it had, I believe 10 pullbacks of at least 25% and at least three or four pullbacks of 40%. And even with all those pullbacks, it still went up a hundred X in 10 years. So, you know, not that it's not that I'm always looking for 10 baggers, but I feel like it did sort of change my mindset that if I am going to try to find these, small cap stocks that could be 10 baggers or hundred baggers, you've got to stick with them. Like you can't get, you know, a five, 10, 15, 20% pullback can't scare you out of the position because you may never get back in and you may never see that big, you know, 10 X, 20 X, 30 X gain. So, I mean, look at Shopify, Shopify came public at like, you know, a $3 billion market cap six or seven years ago. Now it's 140 billion. So, Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you, you find the right stock at the right price and you just you got to find a way to hold on to it, regardless of the, you know, the volatility, and the pullbacks, assuming that the story stays the chain, you know, stays the same, the fundamentals stay intact. And that's what Chris talks about is, you know, in order to get these hundred baggers, you got to find um, he called it, I think, the twin engines, you know, which is um, revenue, revenue growth, the earnings growth and then multiple expansion. So. And I think right now, like, that's why I like a stock like Mohawk, that it's growing 50, 60, 70%. And then I believe you're also going to get some multiple expansion. So right now it's, it's trading at like one time sales, which is crazy. And mm-hmm. I think over the next couple of years, you might see that multiple expand to, you know, two times sales, three times sales, four times sales. And then you start to, you know, you, you, this thing turns into a 10 bagger just off that. So, I mean, motivating words. So, I mean, start small. Um, you know, don't think that you have to hit a home run on every position or every trade. And I would say, uh, I mean, there's so many things you're going to learn along the way, but, um, one of the biggest lessons, especially that I learned this year is, um, and I sound stupid because even though I do trim my winners, um, they're also still positions for me, but don't trim your winners just to add to your losers. So Mm -hmm. I think too many people do that. Like they have a hard time admitting that they bought a stock and it went down and they just, they, they don't want to be wrong. Like, and they're just, maybe they have too much conviction. Maybe it's their ego and they just keep feeding that stock as it goes lower and lower. And it turns in, it turns from a, you know, a, a little, you know, a little loser into a big loser. And, you know, that's how you ruin your portfolio. That's how you ruin your year. So, you know, you do have to know and learn how to feed your winners um, and cut and cut your losers, like admit when you're wrong and get out of a stock while it's still a small loser before it turns into a big loser. Absolutely. That's fantastic advice. I think, um, Jonah, thanks so much. It's been great getting to talk to you, um, hearing how you view the markets and, and analyze different companies. Um, everybody watching, I hope you guys enjoyed And if you did, please remember to leave a like down below and subscribe. If you want to see more videos, just like this one, you can reach out to Jonah on Twitter. I'll have his links down below in the description. Uh, Thanks again, everybody. And I hope you guys um, have a great rest of your evening. I'll see you guys in future videos. Thanks, man.